All right, hello class. So this video is gonna be about energy. It's a topic for chapter four. Um, so yeah, let's continue with our slides, which you guys can access here from, from Canvas. Um, so energy. Um, this will be a bit of a review. I'm sure you, you guys have you know heard uh, about you know kinetic potential energy. Um, so just a little bit review here. Uh, let's define what energy is, right? Uh, we can we know we know it in the layman's term. Right? I have a lot of energy. I can do a lot of things. And actually the scientific term is similar to that, right? Um, so energy is the capacity to do work. So if you have more energy, right, you're going to be able to do more work. And so now what is work though? Let's um, put that uh, uh, into context, right? Uh, work can be defined as any time that there is a force uh, through uh, applied through a distance. Okay. So um, in science, if you're, you know, um, if any time that the distance is displaced uh, with the force, then work is going to be done. Okay, so uh, you can we can write that right in a mathematical equation as work is equal to force times distance. Okay, so now when you have an equation like this with two um, uh, variables, we can we can keep one constant and we can see what happens if we change the other um, uh, variable to see how it affects work, okay? So let's say that we keep distance the same, meaning now I'm gonna push a chair, okay, at the same distance, but in the first instance, I'm gonna push a chair really fast, meaning I'm applying more force. So uh, when I'm pushing the chair really fast, then I'm gonna do more work, right? But then I'm pushing the chair really slow, um, then I'm gonna do less work, right? Because I'm not using as much force, okay? So you see, that makes sense, right? That intuitively makes sense to you. Um, distance. Well, let's keep force the same. So I'm, I'm applying the same amount of force, but in one instance, I'm going to push the chair a further distance, right? Of course, I'm going to use more energy there, right? I'm going to use, I'm applying more work, right? Um, whereas if I just push the chair a short distance, then I'm doing less work, right? So pretty straightforward what, what work is. Um, in this, uh, uh, slide here, right? It's, uh, it's, it's looking at pushing a book across the surface. Same idea as like pushing a chair, right? <clears throat> okay, so there are two types of energy. Um, and you guys may know, you know how energy works already. You might've heard, right? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred one from one type to another. Um, so the two main types of energy we have classified into either kinetic or potential energy. Uh, where kinetic energy is the energy associated with movement. Um, and that's pretty intuitive. Like if something right is in motion, okay, we know it carries energy, right? So for example, you know, a baseball comes flying at your head. You're not just going to stand there and let it hit your head because you know that that baseball carries a lot of energy and it can break your skull, right? It can damage you, right? So it's quite easy to see and, and, uh, uh, quite easy to spot kinetic energy, right? Anything that is in motion. The other kind of energy, potential energy is a little bit more um, sneaky, right? Because it's not in motion. Uh, it's, it's, it's due to its position. Um, it's due to energy being stored. We call that potential energy. So the way I think of it, right, is that potential energy has the potential to hurt you, um, even if it's just sitting still, right? So um, an example of that, of course, would be like, let's say you're, you know, uh, standing underneath um, um, like, uh, uh, a, you know, an object that is heavy, that is hanging from a string, for example, uh, if the string breaks, right, so even though it's not moving at first, if the string breaks, it can fall and hit your head, right? So that heavy weight on a string, that whole system carries potential energy okay, due to its position, okay? Um, so kinetic energy, it, it can be defined by this formula here, one half mv squared. Let's go to the board real quick. This is the formula for kinetic energy. Um, and m stands for mass. This is v which stands for velocity, okay? Um, and this, again, this equation is very intuitive, 
Okay. Now, every time that you see that you guys see an equation, I want you guys to always analyze it, just like we did with work. Okay. So let's analyze this kinetic energy equation. Well, if you have more mass, right, you're gonna carry more kinetic energy. So think of say, you know, um, uh, a little five year old uh, boy running at you and running into you. Okay. Um, it's gonna hurt a little bit, right? But now it's a linebacker going and running at you. Oh, it's gonna hurt a lot more when the linebacker hits you, right? So mass matters, okay? And then it's multiplied by V squared, velocity squared. So velocity is, matters even more because it's the power of two, right? So the faster um, an object is going, the more kinetic energy is going to uh, carry, which makes sense, right? Um, and so if we go and look at our slide here, we can see another example of that. All right, so if you have a bulldozer running into a brick wall, right, it's gonna carry a lot more um, kinetic energy than say a little scooter running into the wall, right? It barely damages the wall, okay? Um, so mass, right, has to do with it. And then if the bulldozer is um, running into the wall at a faster pace, right, it's gonna do much more damage than if it was, you know, running into the wall at, uh, at a, a lower speed. Okay, so remember, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one kind to another. So we see a lot of this energy transfer between kinetic and potential energy. Um, when you toss a coin, this is an example of that. So let's kind of analyze what happens with the pot uh, with energy as um, the coin is sitting on the thumb here and then it gets flipped into the air. So as it gets flipped into the air, Right. At first, it has no kinetic energy, right? Because it's sitting on the thumb. Um, but then you insert energy by way of flicking your thumb. So that energy gets um, converted, right, to kinetic. Uh, and then the kinetic energy actually decreases as the coin goes up in height. Why is that? More of the energy is getting stored as gravity, right? Uh, as gravitational um, energy, right? As the coin gets higher. And so eventually, the coin actually stops, right? At the very top, the coin actually stops. So the kinetic energy goes to zero. We have maximum potential energy at the very top. And then it falls back down because of gravity. And as it does that, the potential energy again gets transferred to kinetic energy. So as the coin is falling, kinetic energy is increasing and potential energy is decreasing. And by the same amount, right? Because energy cannot be created or destroyed, right? So you see that transfer of energy of different types as well. Um, by just looking at, um, you know, a coin getting flipped, right? Um, so we call this the law of conservation energy, right? That energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be converted um, from one type to another. Okay, so some terms that you guys should know. Um, an endergonic change, okay? So an endergonic change is any time you go from a more stable state to um, a less stable state. And you do so by adding energy, okay? So if you're at a more stable state, meaning lower energy state, okay, and that, that's really what you guys should connect. Um, when you are at a lower energy state, you are more stable, okay? So thinking, you know, uh, you're like a ladder, right? If you're on the first step of a ladder, you're more stable than if you're on like the 12th step of a ladder, right? That's a little precarious, okay? So um, all systems work that way. And that's how we think about it in science, okay? So anytime you see more stable, it means low energy as well, okay? So that means in an endergonic change, you're adding energy. See how energy comes on the left side of the equation? When you add energy, then the system becomes less stable, right? Because now the whole thing goes up in energy, okay? And what does that also mean is that you had lesser capacity to work, but now you have greater capacity to work to do work, right? Because energy goes into, uh, in, in, into the system. Um, it also means you were at a lower potential energy and it brings you to a higher potential energy state. So all of these things are synonymous with each other, right? All these four lines are just different ways of saying the same thing, right? But you should recognize that. Um, and if we go to the coin, the flipping of the coin example, then you had the coin in hand, which was a stable state, right? More lower energy state. And then when you did this with your thumb, you added energy so that um, the coin went higher up in the air, right? You increase its potential energy, right? And now the coin is in the air, right? Um, 
how do I remember this term endergonic? En um, is very close to in, right? Okay. Almost like in. So energy in, okay? So endergonic means energy in. That's how I remember it. And then, uh, oh, here's an example. So in our atmosphere, when we have oxygen gas, um, there's energy coming from the sun. Uh, that energy actually splits oxygen gas. So oxygen gas is comprised of two oxygen atoms. Um, and don't worry if you didn't know that um, at this point, but it is, right? Two oxygen atoms together. And you add energy, which will split the two oxygen atoms into two single oxygen atoms, right? Um, so that's what happens is when you add energy, you basically can break bonds, right? Um, that might not seem intuitive, but let's just do an analogy with, say, a chair or a pencil. If I want to make break a pencil or if I want to break this marker, for example, what would I need? I would need to insert energy, right? So it's pretty intuitive um, when you look at it like that, which means if you want to break bonds, in a molecule, you also need to insert energy, okay? So this splitting of O2 by the sun's rays um, in the atmosphere is considered an endergonic process. Okay. <clears throat> so atoms in bonds, right? Um, if you insert energy, you will break that bond so they become separate atoms, okay? Uh, and what you would do is you'd make a more stable molecule become less stable. So yes, that means that O2 was stable, two single oxygen atoms are less stable. Okay. Um, and again, you know, you go from lower potential energy to higher potential energy. Now the opposite change is called exergonic change, right? X meaning out, right? Think about what you guys do with your ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, um, ex-whatever. Do you keep them in your life? No, they need to go out. Okay, so that's how I think about it. X equals out. So energy is going to go out which means you go from a less stable system to a more stable system, right? So a less stable system is a higher um, potential energy system. And when you lose that energy, you go to a lower potential, potential energy, right? And notice how it's different than an endergonic change. The energy comes on the right side of the equation, right? Because you're losing it, okay? You're losing that energy. Um, and that would get you, you know, less capacity to do work, right? You had a greater capacity, but then you lost energy. So now you have less capacity to do work. Um, in the coin example would be your coin in the air. Um, and then as it falls back to the ground, right? The coin on the ground um, uh, uh, has lost energy, right? Um, and so that's an extra gun change. Uh, so now we think about bonds, uh, um, think about chemistry. Um, bond breaking processes, if that's endergonic, then the opposite bond making processes should be exergonic, right? Um, so if it requires energy to break bonds, then you should get energy back by making bonds. And certainly that's what happens, right? So if you have separate atoms and you make a bond between them, you actually get some energy out, right? Energy back, okay? Um, meaning you go from a less stable system to a more stable system, right? You fall from a higher potential energy level to a lower potential level, right? And that's more stable, right? So here's an example in chemistry. When you take just a single oxygen atom and you add it to O2, uh, uh, oxygen molecule, um, you get O3. O3 is called ozone. Yes, it's the same ozone layer that is protecting us from the sun's rays in our atmosphere. And O3 is certainly more stable, okay? More stable than O and O2 by itself, okay? So that's why, um, ozone would form because you make a stable product, right? And that's another uh, law of the universe, everybody. Um, and something that you should keep, keep in mind. It's going to really help you throughout this class and also through life and any other class because it's just a law of nature, okay? This is what we observe in nature is that anything that goes to a more stable state will always happen. It just happens um, spontaneously um, because that is the way of the universe, right? Um, so in a lot of, you know, uh, problems that you're going to encounter in this class, in a lot of science, in, in anything, engineering, um, you can just keep that rule in mind, right? Things want to go to a more stable state, okay?
Okay, let's look at some forms of energy. Um, so you guys know some of these already, like electrical energy, right? We know we're not going to put our finger in like a, a electrical outlet, right? Um, because that's going to hurt, right? That electrical energy is actually a kinetic energy, right? Because it comes from the movement of electrons. That's why it's called electricity. When move, uh, when electrons move, it creates a current and it gives electricity, right? Um, so it is a form of kinetic energy. Um, then heat and thermal energy is also another form of kinetic energy. Um, and that has to do with um, vibration, um, vibrational motion of the molecules that make up whatever that material is. Okay? So everything has a heat associated with it, right? As in, you know, you can take a thermometer and you can touch different things um, around you and it'll read different temperatures because what's actually happening is you're measuring how fast um, the molecules vibrate in each of these materials, okay? And so that's why it's a kinetic energy. Then we have light or radiant energy. It's a kinetic energy as well because it's um, associated with energy transitions in an atom, right? So that's that's motion. Um, and we have nuclear energy. Now, nuclear energy is a potential energy because nuclear energy is stored energy within the nucleus of the atom, okay? Um, it's a very powerful energy. So um, as you know, right, the dropping of nuclear bomb um, is huge, right? It releases so much energy because all of that energy is stored in the nucleus of all these atoms. Um, and so if that energy was to get released, it would cause mass destruction, in which it had happened um, at one time, thankfully just one time, um, and it can never happen again. Um, but the reason why you have such massive amounts of energy coming out of the nucleus, just think what think about what nucleus is, right? It has protons inside. Protons inside the nucleus, they're all positively charged. And so they're actually in really close proximity. And they actually don't like each other, right? Because like charges repel each other. And so there is a lot of tension in that nucleus. Um, and normally it's stabilized by neutrons um, within the atom, but if it gets destabilized, all that energy could get released, right? And so that's why it's considered a potential energy, right? Because it's not in motion, but it's there, it's stored. Okay. Uh, we got chemical energy, which is also a potential energy. And it's a potential energy through the attachment of the atoms themselves. So the attachment or the bonds of the atoms, how you can think of it, um, store energy as well. And okay. so the bonds of that hold the atoms together is stored energy as well, okay? Um, so uh, an example of chemical energy, for example, would be like dynamite, right? Dynamite, you know that um, even if a, the dynamite is not flying at you, it's the dynamite is just, you know, sitting on the floor, you know that you just shouldn't be touching it um, because you know that it's going to, you know, if, if there's, you know, a shock or if there's heat, that it's just going to blow up due to the breaking of these chemical bonds that release huge, huge amount of energy. <clears throat> okay, so let's do a little practice, right? We just did a little overview of energy. Let's see if you guys can um, pick which has the higher energy and see if you guys can classify it as either kinetic or potential energy. So we have the first example. Uh, I have an uh, argon atoms, AR, uh, traveling at 428 meters per second or argon atoms traveling at 456 meters per second. Which one would higher have higher energy? Well, obviously the faster traveling is, right? The 456 meters per second. Now, if they're traveling, then it's a kinetic uh, energy, right? Okay. All right. Now the second line, it's asking 428 meters per second argon atoms or 428 meters per second krypton atoms. Okay. How are you guys going to judge that? They're traveling at the same speed, but remember, kinetic energy also has to do with mass, right? So which one's heavier, argon or krypton? Go ahead and look on your periodic table. You're going to find that krypton are heavier, right? And so you're going to say uh, krypton atoms have higher energy, and it is kinetic, right? Because they're traveling. In the third, you have sodium plus close to a Cl minus, or sodium plus far away from a Cl minus. Hmm. Okay. You you can intuitively do this. Let's think about it. Um, 
opposite charges attract each other, right? So if opposite charges are closer to each other, they want to be close to each other, that's more stable, right? That's lower energy, okay? Remember how we connect those words? More stable means lower energy. Um, sodium plus and Cl minus far apart, that would be higher energy, okay? So that's the one that's higher energy. And is it kinetic or potential? It's potential because they're not moving. They're just, it's due to their position, right? <clears throat> okay, the fourth one, R-O-O-R or two R-O's. So this is a molecule, right? R-O-O-R, they're connected to each other or two separate fragments of RO, which has higher energy. Hmm. Remember how it works? When you break bonds, it requires energy, right? But when you make bonds, it releases energy, okay? So two separate things is gonna be higher energy than, one, than when you combine them, right? And so two ROs would have higher energy and it is potential energy, right? Because it's not in motion, it's due to the bonds. Right. It's a chemical energy. Right. All right. Um, this one down here, the fifth example, H, gas, just hydrogen atom, um, or, o, uh, or sorry, H gas and O2 gas, or HO2 gas together. So again, remember, when things combine, they release energy. When they split up, it requires energy, right? And so when things are separate, that's when you have higher energy. Okay, so H gas and O2 gas will be higher in energy. And again, it'll be a potential energy, right? Because we're talking about chemical um, energy, right? So these two examples were, were similar. Okay, the last one, solid CO2 or gaseous CO2, right? They're both the same thing, right? CO2 and CO2, but look at their states of matter. This should be easy to say, right? Which one has motion, right? Has more motion, gaseous CO2, right? is faster traveling. So it's gonna have higher energy and it's gonna be um, kinetic. Okay, let's talk about units of energy. Um, you guys know some of this already, right? Like we eat food because we need to consume calories in order to for us to um, get uh, enough energy to do things, right? Um, so that's where it comes from, it's the calorie. Uh, so the calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's how it's defined. And for short, you can write C-A-L or cal. Okay. Sometimes if you have a lot of energy, then we um, we talk about K-cal. K, remember little K is kilo. So a kilo calorie is just a thousand calories, right? Just like a kilo meter is a thousand meters or a kilogram is a thousand grams, right? So Kilocalorie then would be defined as the energy needed to raise 1,000 grams of water by one degree Celsius. Right? Food calories, as I mentioned earlier, right? Food calories is actually a kilocalorie. Okay, um, you know when we talk about it, we want we don't say that, but that's what it is, right? Uh, a food calorie, one food calorie is a thousand times more than just the actual calorie. Okay, right? so it's a kilocalorie. Um, some conversion factors for you. Okay, again, you don't have to memorize this. This is on your conversion sheet. Okay? And um, you get access to that as well, right? It's in Canvas, scroll all the way down to the bottom module that says allowed for quizzes and exams. And you can find the conversion sheet that has all of this, okay? All you need to know is how to um, calculate, right? If I was to ask you, um, you know, how many joules are in 10 calories, you'd be able to tell me, right? Uh, using these conversion factors. Um, or I can ask you how many joules are in four kilowatt hour, right? You should be able to tell me. All right, let's talk about units of energy. Um, it might make more sense if we just go back to um, our equation here. Right, remember Ke is one half times mb squared. Remember, M is mass, and so it's going to have units of kilogram, okay? And then velocity is meters per second, right? These, these are the SI units. So it's going to be meters per second, and you will square that, 
right? Because it's V squared, which will get you what? Kilograms meters squared per second squared. Okay. So this is what one joule is. Okay. One joule, just joule for short, because uh, we don't want to say that that whole thing. Right. But that's how um that's how we get that kind of long unit. Okay, but then we just like, we'll call it a joule, just easier, okay? But that's where it comes from, is that kinetic energy equation, right? Mass times velocity squared. Um, okay, um, and then you have all these, all right? <clears throat> just to give you guys uh, an idea of, you know, how much energies are in thing, this is kind of a cool picture uh, to show you, like, the massive scales of some energy, you know, that's in various events, Um Obviously, just looking at the numbers, you can see that you can have very little energy exchange uh, where the um, 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 uh, exponent here is negative 30, right? Or you have really large energy exchange where the exponent is like in the 70. Um, and this is joules, right? And so the creation of the universe, about 10 to the 65th joules. It's a lot of energy um, contained in the universe. Um, if you just even look at... Let's say a severe earthquake, you know, that's that's pretty energetic, right? It's about 10 to the 15 joule, right? Just to kind of give you an idea, right? What 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 these are. Um burning a match is about one joule. Okay, okay so look a couple more terms for you guys to know. Uh, external kinetic energy, it's the kinetic energy associated with the overall movement of the body. So Let's take my body, for example. Right now, there's a lot of kinetic energy going on, even if I'm not actually moving, like walking, I mean, right? But I'm definitely moving. I'm waving my arms around. I'm talking, right? All of those are external kinetic energy because you can see it. You can see um, the overall movement of the body on the outside. Um, but let's say that even if I stand super still and I don't speak, right? There's still kinetic energy in my body inside my body. So that one is called internal kinetic energy because, you know, that's associated with, um, you know, uh, the particles within my body, right? Um, even if my heart, you know, um, my heart's obviously beating, right? So that's, but that's still even considered external kinetic energy, right? But we are talking internal as in all the vibrations, um, my cells, right? All of the particles within the body, um, and that would be called, considered internal. Okay, uh, if we take a coin, uh, actually pro probably a much better example than my body because um, bodies are very complex. Um, but let's take, yeah, let's take a coin because it's simpler. Um, external kinetic energy is associated with the overall motion. So if the coin is flying around, that would be the external kinetic energy. But even if the coin is sitting still, what's moving inside the coin is molecular vibration, right? Of whatever the coin is made up of, um, you know, if it's copper penny, then it'll be like copper atoms like vibrating around, right? And that'd be considered internal kinetic energy. Yep. Uh, heat. Okay, heat, you guys should know. Um, uh, of course, if you experience heat, you know what that is. But heat is actually, it's an energy transfer. Um, and it's always going to go from the uh, a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature due to collisions of particles. Um, so heat transfer can only happen when there are collisions, as in when two things touch each other, right? Then the heat can transfer and always goes from the hotter object to the colder object and never the other way around, okay? Never the other way around, right? Always hot to cold. Um, so here, here it is, right? Here's the direction of heat, heat transfer, always from hot, the red region, to the colder region, uh, which is in blue. Okay, finally, radiant energy. Um, radiant energy is the electromagnetic energy, um, and it behaves like a stream of particles. Um, it's actually a wave, a wave of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So, you know, what comes out of the sun is that, is the electromagnetic energy. <coughs> and this is what we mean by the electric and magnetic fields. All lights have these two perpendicular oscillating fields. The electric field um, is shown in blue here, okay? And see how it's 90 degrees from the magnetic field? They can't be distangled, okay? what If you have an electric field, you must have a magnetic field. They'll just induce uh, 
uh, the other field in each other. So they're never untangled. They always travel like all light has this. Um, and the difference is in the electric field, that's where charges can be um, uh, influenced. And then uh, the, the magnetic field is where magnets can be influenced. Okay, so if you look at the whole energy spectrum, uh, we have a lot, right? From the really low energy, that would be like radio waves and televisions uh, uh, waves. Um, that's low energy. Okay. And then the really high energy would be the gamma rays. Okay, this is what we use. Uh, that's what hap happens with radioactive decays. They shoot off gamma rays. And then gamma rays are so powerful that they can also be used to treat cancer, right? They're just directed at cancer cells and it kills them, right? So high, high energy is the gamma rays. Um, then we have microwaves after radio waves. That's next highest. Um, then we have infrared. Uh, that's associated with heat. And then we have smack in the middle is the visible light spectrum, which is what we see, right? Um, me and you, we see energy in this range, just a very small sliver, right? All the other energies look, are invisible to us, right? They're colorless, okay? And then above visible is ultraviolet. Above ultraviolet is x-rays. That's used for, you know, um, seeing through tissues. Um, of course, you know, ultraviolet, that's what causes uh, um, sunburns. And if you're exposed for too long, right, you have a risk of getting skin cancer. Um, so that's why you should put on your sunscreen, right? Yeah, so all these forms of radiant energies um, uh, have different energy, right? So you should know those, by the way, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You should know them in order, all right? From lowest energy to highest energy. You should also know your colors from lowest energy to highest energy. Red is the lowest, violet is the highest. And the way that's easy to remember, guys, Roy G. Biv. Right, you might have heard of this before. Roy G. Bit, right? Energy increasing in that direction. So we got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Right. So know that. Okay. Um, there's a reason why red light is used in photography, you know, uh, when film was being developed. <clears throat> they would put they would do it in a room with red light because red light is the less penetrating, is the, the least energy, uh, the lowest energy. Right? So it would protect the film. Um, okay, so that's it for the energy topic. I'll see you guys next time.